super unfashionable it may appear, I'm actually convinced that there really are good reasons to believe that God exists. And let me just sketch tonight briefly some of those reasons. There is zero evidence for the existence of God. On the other hand, I think we've got five good reasons, all of which point to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute value, who has revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and who can be personally known and experienced. My argument against God's existence doesn't depend upon genes. It's the absence of evidence. In fact, I would venture to say that Christianity as a worldview stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other ism or philosophy of life that you might care to enunciate. And for that reason, I find myself enthusiastically a Christian theist. Well, that's a little bit of an introduction um, to the things that we're going to be talking about uh, today and over the next four weeks. It's a little bit of a different focus for us. Often at church, we might be going through the Bible, looking at a particular passage, looking at what it says, what it might mean for our lives. But every now and then, um, yeah, we have a bit of a different focus where we might look at things like, yeah, the evidence for the Bible, for God's existence, uh, different reasons that we might believe, uh, which, yeah, is something I think is important um, for all Christians to be thinking about. I know that it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, uh, and that's why we're not doing it all the time. Uh, also because the Bible has some pretty cool stuff to say, we want to be looking at that as well. Um, definitely for me, it's, it's a bit of an area of passion and interest to think about philosophy, think about history, think about science, and I'm sure that hopefully for some of you guys um, it is as well. Um, I might just pray, actually, and then, we'll, and then we're going to get stuck in. Thank you, God, for this time that we have now uh, to come and examine some of the evidence for you and for the chance that we have over these next four weeks to really um, ask some big questions and ponder some big things about yeah, life and the universe and uh, yeah, whether we can have faith and have reason and yeah, just some of the big things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, God, I just pray that you would be here with us and uh, that you would help this to be something which isn't just a dry uh, kind of examination of facts, but something that uh, is really practical and helpful, even just in our own faith and belief. And um, uh, yeah, definitely as well in the way that we reach out to other people, in the way that we engage with our friends and our family and our communities too. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, like I said earlier, there's going to be a bit of a Q&A opportunity afterwards. So if there's stuff, I guess, that I'm talking about at all, where you're like, I didn't quite get that part, or yeah, have a question, or even better, an objection um, to any of the stuff that we talk about, that would be fantastic. And that's kind of what the Q&A is all about. It's definitely not necessarily just a one-way download. And absolutely 100%, got to say as well, that I'm definitely not an expert, as much as I might be enthusiastic about this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert, and I don't know everything there is to know. I do make it a bit of a personal mission um, just because I've got an interest as well to try and do a fair bit of reading and I like listening to debates. I've always um, been pretty keen on um, debates and yeah, I guess that's sort of like intellectual back and forward and um, yeah, make it a mission as well to be reading lots of atheist books, not just the Christian books, the Christian perspective as well as perspectives from other religions. I think that's a really important thing is to actually, uh, if we're hoping that other people will be open-minded in hearing what we've got to say, I think, personally, I, I find it really interesting to hear where they're coming from as well. So that's sort of um, yeah, my own personal passion and hopefully there's some other people in the room that have a bit of a passion as well. But let's get passionate together. Um, I think there's a bit of a narrative in our culture, a bit of a narrative that says that reason and faith are two incompatible things. A bit of a narrative in our culture that says that the belief in a God or a belief in theism is kind of just believing in, you know, fairy stories or like wishful thinking. It's this archaic set of beliefs. It's outdated. It's illogical. It's stupid. I think that's kind of a bit of the narrative, a bit of what the culture that we live in has to say. Western mindset about religion, about having faith in God is that it's kind of like having an invisible friend and there's jokes that are thrown around about making it the equivalent of believing in the flying spaghetti monster and different things like that. There's a narrative I think in our culture that 
throughout history and especially in the last sort of couple of centuries that reason and science has sort of superseded faith and theism and religion. And I've had plenty of chats uh, just in my own journey with friends and family, lots of different people, uh, people through the school and just, you know, workplaces and wherever else that insist that faith and reason are opposites. I remember one particular conversation a few years ago uh, where I was chatting with a member of my family um, who was saying that they, they couldn't believe in God or the Bible. They'd say, you know, oh, I wouldn't hold it against anyone else. You know, everyone um, gets to believe what they want to believe. But, you know, for me, I couldn't believe I'm um, someone who values science and religion is just about blind faith. And, you know, reason is about believing something because there's evidence and faith is about believing something when there's no evidence. And that's sort of been the difference between reason and faith. And I tried to, you know, in the conversation, sort of say to them, actually, uh, my understanding and my approach is that faith isn't necessarily about um, you know, blindly believing something or believing something in spite of evidence. Uh, and particularly when it comes to God and when it comes to um, the Christian faith, uh, I actually don't think that the Bible encourages us to have a blind faith. I think the Bible actually encourages us to have an informed Maybe even faith can be a misleading word. Maybe even like a, a trust in God might be more what faith is referring to. But this um, person that I was having a conversation with insisted uh, that, no, that's, that's not what faith is. Faith isn't trust. Faith is blind belief, basically. And, you know, I was trying to say, no, I think there's actually really good reasons to believe in God. I, I don't think it just has to be about blind faith. I think there are actually good reasons to believe in God. And he's insisting no there's there's no evidence for god you just have to have blind faith and believe and to to that claim i guess that there's no evidence for god i i just thought you know i would ask have you ever heard of the fine tuning argument do you know anything about you know the fine tuning of the universe and how that is sometimes considered to be evidence for god and he says no i've never heard of that i said oh, well have you ever heard of the cosmological argument. Uh, no, not familiar with that one. Have you ever heard of the moral argument or you know, some of the evidence that exists for the accuracy of the Bible or for the resurrection of Jesus? Like how much reading and thinking have you done about this? And you know, his reply is, well, I'm not really familiar with any of that, but just like, even in spite of that, he just kept coming back to and, and, and insisting there is no evidence for God and kept coming back to faith by definition is the opposite of reason. And that sort of insistence um, that faith by definition has to be blind faith kind of reminded me a little bit of a debate um, that I saw between John Lennox and Richard Dawkins. John, uh, Richard Dawkins, you might know, is the um, best-selling author of The God Delusion and yeah, one of the most uh, famous atheists in the world. And John Lennox is a professor, um, I think they're both professors of Cambridge or Oxford or something like that. Um, he's a professor in um, pure mathematics. And yeah, they were having a debate just after the release of The God Delusion. And I've just got a couple of minute clip where they're talking about faith and reason and the connection between them. So I think if you've got that ready there, Chris, that'd be great. And faith can be very dangerous, especially if it's coupled with a blind obedience to an evil authority. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to emphasize is true whether the blind faith is that of religious or secular people. But not all faith is by blind faith, because faith itself carries with it the ideas of belief, trust, commitment, and is therefore only as robust as the evidence for it. I can't speak authoritatively for other religions, but faith in the Christian sense is not blind. And indeed, I do not know a serious Christian who thinks it is. Indeed, as I read it, blind faith in idols and figments of the human imagination, in other words, delusional gods, is roundly condemned in the Bible. My faith in God and Christ as the Son of God is no delusion. It is rational and evidence-based. Part of the evidence is objective. Some of it comes from science. Some comes from history and some is subjective coming from experience. When you say 
faith is rational and evidence-based, I mean, if that were true, it wouldn't need to be faith, would it? I mean, if there, if there were evidence for it, uh, why would you need to call it faith? You'd say just evidence. And when you said that, we, that, that faith in relativity, in, in Einstein's theory of, of relativity is, is evidence-based, that of course it is, but, um, the, but the evidence is, is all important. I mean, Einstein's predictions fit in with, um, with uh, observed fact and, they, and with a whole body of theory. Whereas we only need to use the word faith when there isn't any evidence. I presume you've got faith in your wife. Is there any evidence for that? On yes, which plenty. You base it? yes, plenty of evidence. Um, mm. I, It's a little bit of a cheap shot to poor Richard Dawkins. Um, that's, yeah, a moment that is well known for him. But um, yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, that he's so insistent that anything that requires faith doesn't have evidence for it. The two sort of contradict each other, and John Lennox sort of rightly, rightly points out, well, you have faith in your wife, don't you? Um, but is there evidence behind that? And, you know, he sort of goes, well, yes. <laughs> um, yes, I do have faith in my wife, and yes, there is lots of evidence for it. The two aren't necessarily... Um, contradictory things in the same way that we might put our faith in a spouse or we might put our faith in something like gravity or we might put our faith in the very chair that we're sitting on faith itself doesn't have to be unfounded faith itself doesn't have to be something illogical faith i think ultimately just sort of means trusting it doesn't it and it can be an informed and a reasonable trust and the bible i really think don't uh, does not encourage blind faith I think actually if you read through the Bible, uh, at no point is it telling people to just believe blindly or without good reason. Uh, that uh, passage which appeared in the little um, teaser trailer video thing that I made for the series um, was from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where the Apostle Peter says, always be prepared to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. You know, so Peter is saying to his fellow Christians, think about the reasons why you believe. You know, if somebody asks you, why are you a Christian? Why are you a follower of Jesus? Would you be able to give them the reasons? Um, even when you read through the Gospels, when Jesus is calling people to follow him, uh, he didn't just come and say, this is who I am and expect people to believe it or to buy it or to follow him just because he told them to. Uh, the Bible is actually really clear that the reason, the primary reason that he performed miracles for people was to show them that he really was who he said that he was. So they could actually believe it, to give them evidence of the claims that he was making. And similarly, the prophecies um, that happen all throughout the Bible very clearly are stated that the purpose of those is to show uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, that these prophecies that are in place hundreds of years um, yeah, centuries, even millennia before Jesus' arrival. The reason that those prophecies are there is so that people could actually trust that Jesus really is someone special, that he really is the one um, that God wanted to send. He didn't expect us to just believe Jesus' claims. He gave us clear evidence, and particularly for the people in those times, he gave them clear evidence um, wanting to follow him. Uh, Jesus himself, when he's talking um, to different people, he doesn't just encourage them to follow him without it, uh, without thinking it through. In fact, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus is talking about um, some would-be followers of his, and he gives them an analogy. He says, uh, you know, a builder, if a, if a builder was going to go and build a tower, they're not going to go and start the project without first checking that they have the materials to actually complete the job. They're first going to think it through and prepare and make sure that they're prepared before they commit to building the tower. And likewise, a general doesn't march his army into a battle without first doing a bit of a census and some scouting and, and really weighing up, is this a battle that we could actually win? And thinking through the strategy of it, you don't just commit to a battle before you've really thought it through. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, do your homework, like investigate, think about it, weigh it up. Jesus wasn't one who just tried to like coerce as many people into following him as possible. He encouraged them, he wanted them to really think it through. The Bible doesn't encourage us to have blind faith, but a faith based in reason. Uh, in that little intro video that I put together, you could hear um, people talking over the top of it. 
And it's just short snippets from another debate, the debate between an atheist, um, Peter Atkins, and a Christian, William Lane Craig, where Atkins insists a couple of times there is no evidence for the existence of God. And through the debate, um, William Lane Craig offers five specific reasons, five specific arguments for God's existence and runs through all of the arguments. He's a philosopher by trade and he has you know, very clear premises and conclusions and unpacks each of them. And when it's Peter Atkins' turn again, rather than engage and try and you know, debunk or even address the particular arguments that have been raised or offering up any kind of yeah, objection to the arguments, he simply goes back to talking about why it's important to have reason rather than choosing blind faith, which obviously religion is just blind faith, and how there's no evidence for the existence of God. It doesn't actually really address the evidence that's been put forward to him. Over the course of these four weeks, um, today is a bit of an introduction just to talk a bit about faith and reason, but we are going to talk about one specific argument or maybe you might call it proof or reason, I think is probably a good word, reason why it is actually rational and reasonable to believe that there is a God, especially in a, a culture where that's not just an assumption that people make anymore. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about today is faith, reason and the universe. Next week, can I tell you, I wanted this to be week one, but I also knew that I'd have to do some introduction and I needed to save it for week two so that we could do it properly. But next week, I am excited. I almost just want to like you know, like when it's Christmas a week out and you're like, oh, it's only four more sleeps to go. I'm excited for next Sunday because we're going to talk about my favorite part. It was about random chance, about probability. And is it possible that the universe just turned out the way that it did? It's very exciting. I'm very excited for next week. I wish it could have been this week, um, but we'll still have some fun this week. Then the week after that. So like, I guess the first two weeks are talking about, is there actually a God? That's, that's the point of it. Is atheism an option? Is there a God? Is there not? But the first two weeks will only establish, I think, whether or not there is a God or, or be arguments that move towards establishing that. But then I guess even if you establish that, then how do you know whether actually the Christian God is the right one? Obviously, lots of people have different ideas about God. So is the Bible any different to other holy texts? Is Jesus any more believable than any other religious leader? That's kind of going to be the focus of week number three. And then week number four, I think, is an important objection um, that people have that I find overwhelmingly is kind of the key objection that people have to God's existence. I often find it's got nothing to do with science um, or history or anything like that. Often it's just the kind of existential, but how could this world be the way that it is if there really is a God? And we're going to talk about that in week four. So a four-week series, it's very short. Um, there's obviously whole books written. I'll hand you a book um, if you want to um, come and chat sometime, or we'll just sit there and chat for hours. There's great video resources um, on these different topics. Uh, and like I said, after the service, we're going to have a Q&A for those enthusiastic enough to stick around. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different reasons, I think, that uh, people give for the existence of God. Like I said, William Lane Craig in that particular debate talks about five key reasons. There's a great series um, on Right Now Media, which we as a church have, everyone here has access to, um, which talks about eight particular reasons uh, we're only going to be looking at two of them, one this week and one next week. Um, but the one that we're looking at today is a nice kind of simple and short one. And it's an argument or a reason, I guess, to believe in God that's called the cosmological argument. And we're going to present it in a kind of philosophical way because, you know, why not? Um, so it, it follows, as all good philosophies do, a, a clear set of premises uh, and then we'll talk about each of the premises and, and, and a conclusion. So the logic of the argument goes something like this. The first premise in the argument or in the, in the reason is that everything that has a beginning has a prior cause. So have a bit of a think about that. Everything that has a beginning has a prior cause. That's the first premise, the first statement that sort of maybe needs to be proven, but, but is a key building block in this. Basically what it's saying is that everything that begins to exist must have come from something else. If it, if it came into being, if it didn't exist, and now it does, it must have come from something else before it. That's the first premise. The second premise is that the universe has a beginning. Basically, that premise is just that the universe hasn't been around forever. And therefore, it's a, it's a nice and quick argument. 
Therefore, following on logically from premise one and premise two, premise three is just, therefore, that the universe has a prior cause. Now, yeah, if these three premises can be shown to be true, uh, then what it basically shows is that something outside the universe must have caused the universe. It must have a prior cause, that there is something else which caused the universe. Okay, that's the point of this argument. Something which, by definition, if it's outside of the natural universe, something which is supernatural, something not contained within nature. So basically, if you can prove these three premises, then there is something supernatural, isn't there? There's something outside of the universe, there's something outside of nature or before nature or however you want to, something beyond the natural universe, something, yeah, supernatural. So does the argument work? Let's have a quick look through the three premises, starting with premises number three, which is just a conclusion. It's not even really a statement. Um, it's kind of just a tautology if, uh, or like a restating of the first two premises. It's not making any particular claim in and of itself. It's just stating clearly what would be the result if the first two premises could be proven. You know what I mean? It's just kind of a, it's just a shuffling of words from the first two premises. So you don't really have to look into that to see if that's true or not. It's just a tautology. So let's go back then to the first two premises that they're the ones that sort of need proving. Firstly, the first premise is everything that has a beginning has a prior cause. Now that premises isn't really contested in science. In fact, you could probably argue that that kind of is the basis of the entire scientific method. The idea that everything that has a beginning has a prior cause, that almost it's not just supported by science, that kind of is science. Like that is the scientific method. And to believe um, that this premise is not true, to, I guess to, to disagree with premise one is to believe that things do just suddenly exist without any cause or explanation or justification, that things just happen, that there's no reason, there's no cause, things just exist, they didn't come from anywhere. That, I guess, is what you'd have to believe to disagree with this. And that, I think, is kind of the exact opposite of science, isn't it? Like, that's the opposite of what the scientific method tells us, which is that everything is cause and effect and everything has a cause. Now, I do know that we've got at least one science teacher in the room. And anyone who, who plays the game a little bit deeper and knows anything about quantum mechanics, um, any, everyone else tune out just for a second. <laughs> but um, anyone who is keen or, or just wants to talk about quantum mechanics, because that does have an interesting role in this particular um, discussion. Very keen to talk about that during the Q&A, uh, if anyone's keen to raise it. But ultimately, uh, I think that the consensus is that quantum mechanics doesn't violate this premise. Um, that really premise one is uh, just a statement of the scientific method and that all of our history and experience and science supports the idea that when an object or an event comes into existence, it's because something else caused it. I don't think that's a controversial thing. I don't think quantum mechanics actually uh, refutes that either. But we can talk about that a bit more later if you want. But premise one is pretty hard to deny um, without just basically saying I reject the entire scientific method. That's kind of the only way around premise one is I don't believe in science. So premise two. Premise two might be perhaps the more vulnerable of the two premises, if you're talking about whether or not it's believable. And historically, uh, the cosmological argument has been around for a very long time, for centuries. And historically, it is the one that people disagreed with, that people um, who, yeah, don't agree in the supernatural or don't, yeah, agree with the statement that's being made. If they're looking for a hole, premise two is usually, or historically, the one that they would attack, that the universe has a beginning. That, they would say, is not true. Centuries ago, the way to get around the cosmological argument was to suggest that the universe does not have a beginning. For a long time, the atheistic perspective, the perspective of, yeah, explaining the universe without God, was that the universe itself is eternal, that the universe itself has been around forever, 
Therefore, it has no beginning. Therefore, it needs no cause. It has just always existed. That way, if it has just always existed, you could say that its existence is not contingent on anything else. It just exists as its own necessity. It is uncaused if it's been there from the beginning. And like I said, that was the working theory of atheism for centuries. But there have been some major scientific discoveries and developments over the last 150-ish years that have pretty much completely eliminated that possibility, that idea that the universe could be eternal, apart from some pretty powerful philosophical problems with that. Um, even, you know, philosophy is kind of a bit of a softer science and some people aren't that interested in what philosophy might have to say about it. But even just to stick with clearer empirical science, there's a whole bunch of different theories and developments that have come along. Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, the discovery of the red shift and the demonstration of the expansion of the universe, the observation of background radiation, particularly the laws of thermodynamics. Ultimately, these are some of the theories that whether you want to call it the Big Bang or you have some other idea or word for it, or some other theory, either way, the science is overwhelming that our universe has not been around forever. Those theories that I mentioned, what they essentially prove is that the universe is expanding that it's decaying, that it's gaining entropy and losing high grade energy. And so apart from the separate philosophical proofs that the universe can't be eternal, there are numerous major scientific proofs that confirm the universe must have had a beginning, that it can't have been decaying forever, <laughs> that it can't have been expanding forever. And all of it traces back to a starting point. The universe has a beginning. Funnily enough, the Big Bang potentially, and, and there might be people in the room with different opinions, I don't actually think it matters too much, but funnily enough, the Big Bang was not <laughs> a bad idea when it comes to theism and the idea that there's a God. The idea that the universe has a beginning, a finite beginning, completely blows any objection um, to this second premise of the cosmological argument. There really is no longer a scientific case to be made that the universe has existed eternally. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, that premise too is also airtight. So that is the cosmological argument. That's one of many different potential reasons or evidence or proofs um, for the existence of God. For me, I consider it, I guess, a pretty powerful line of argument. I guess what it's really saying, if you want it sort of in the boiled down terms, is that there's no other explanation for this universe than God. Like, it, well, actually, God is a big term, isn't it? Um, but there has to be an explanation for the universe, I guess is maybe a better way of putting it. And the explanation has to be something outside of the universe, outside of space, outside of time, uh, outside of matter, something eternal, something immaterial, something non-physical, and that kind of is a pretty good definition, I think, of God. I think we'll get back more to that in a second. But when we're talking about God being the original, so if, if the universe uh, ultimately has a beginning point and it needs an explanation, this is kind of, I think, how the sort of schoolyard version of that whole discussion and that whole argument and debate might go. This is... Um, this is good old theist um, Timmy, and this is atheist Andrew, okay? Andrew, where do you think the world came from? I think it came from the Big Bang. Okay, but where did the Big Bang come from? I don't know. See, there must have been a God that caused it. But where did God come from? I don't know. Well, why is it okay for God to not come from anywhere or to not have an explanation? If everything needs a cause, doesn't God need a cause too? Or if you're fine with the fact that God doesn't need a cause, why can't you just apply the same logic and say the universe doesn't need a cause? Yeah? I think that's sort of a, a 
fairly accurate. I've, I've had similar conversations, or less, definitely overheard sort of similar conversations like that. If everything needs a cause, if the whole premise is that everything needs a cause, then why is God exempt from that? Aren't you just kind of like scooching the problem back one step and now you've, instead of the universe needing an explanation, now you just have God there, but he needs an explanation too. But if you have a look again at the premises, the cosmological argument is not saying that everything must have a cause. The clear statement in the cosmological argument is that everything that has a beginning has a prior cause. Which, when you think about our universe and our human experience, you're like, well, what doesn't have a beginning? <laughs> because like everything has a beginning, right? So it kind of just seems like it's an obvious thing. But maybe an example of this in our universe that we're familiar with that isn't God might be something like certain laws of mathematics. Many laws of maths are not considered contingent or caused by anything else because they never began to exist. There was never a time before those mathematical principles. In fact, even whether they really exist or not is kind of up for debate. But to use technical language, yeah, their, their existence is not contingent, but they exist by necessity certain laws of mathematics. There is no prior cause that triggered mathematics. There was nothing that came before that then triggered those mathematical laws. So again, the cosmological argument is not saying that everything has a beginning, that everything needs a cause. In fact, the cosmological argument is saying the opposite. It's saying that everything that began to exist needs a cause, but ultimately there has to be something that doesn't need a cause, something that wasn't caused. There has to be an original cause, something that has always existed. It's the only logical explanation that at some point you have to get to something that doesn't have anything that caused it, something that has always existed by necessity, not by contingency, something that didn't come into existence, but something eternal, something outside space and the physical universe. So if we're talking about an uncaused cause, what we're talking about is this. We're talking about something, and I think there's gonna be something come up on the screen as well. We're talking about an uncaused cause being something which must be, if, if it explains our universe, it must be outside the universe. It must be outside of space. It must be outside of time. It must be eternal. It must be outside of matter. It must be immaterial. It must be ultimately powerful. It must be powerful enough to create the entire universe. And many would argue it must have the ability or the agency to create the universe. So when you look at that set of attributes, which is the only explanation, you can call that set of attributes anything you want to. You can give it any kind of name you want, but ultimately that is basically the definition of God. You can call it God. Some people like to talk about we're all part of like a computer simulation, like the matrix kind of thing or whatever. Like if, they, if it fits all of those things, then that's cool. But basically you've just, it's God by another name. Or we're all, you know, like we're all like in a dream that an alien is having or something like that. But it's like, if it fits all those bills, it doesn't, it's God. Like this is just to show that there must be something outside of space, outside of time, outside of matter, ultimately powerful, the ability or the agency to create. And that's basically the definition of God. Another simple way to put this whole idea is the idea that something cannot come from nothing. That's another way that this is sort of sometimes phrased. You can't have something that comes into existence from nothingness. You can't just have nothing, true nothingness, and then randomly something. Either it has to have come from somewhere else or it has to have always existed. You can't have nothing and then something. It must have either come from somewhere else or have always existed. That's the only logical option that we're given. Back in 2013, um, I was lucky enough to go with some friends to a debate um, down in Sydney at Town Hall uh, between William Lane Craig, who's a great, well, he's the one um, in that other debate that I uh, clipped together for that video. Uh, between William Lane Craig and a guy called Lawrence Krauss, who's a fantastic and very like fun and um, charismatic uh, 
cosmological physicist. <laughs> that sounds like a contradiction in terms of <laughs> charismatic cosmological physicist. But no, he's a good guy. He's fun. And they were debating the question, can something come from nothing? And so they were debating basically this cosmological argument, but just by under different terms. And most, uh, most cosmological physicists that I've come across, most of the leading cosmological physicists in the world are kind of agnostics. They, they don't really want to um, mark their colors or whatever for, for one tribe or the other. A lot of them are just kind of like, I'm just going to try and stay impartial to all of this. And uh, yeah, don't want to label themselves as either a theist or an atheist. But Lawrence Krauss is strongly an atheist physicist. And it was really interesting um, to hear him and William Lane Craig debating whether or not it is actually possible for something to come out of nothing. And there were some really interesting things that came out of Krauss's presentation in particular. Um, Krauss was saying, and you can, you can actually go and you can watch um, this discussion online. Krauss was actually saying that you can have things come from nothing, depending on what your definition of nothing is. <laughs> and William Lane Craig as a philosopher had some interesting things to say about that. But here are a few quotes from Krauss, here trying to the debate, trying to show that something can come from nothing. Here is a few reflections on nothingness that Krauss had. There are a variety of forms of nothing, and they all have physical definitions. That's an interesting statement about nothing. <laughs> Next one. Nothing weighs something. Okay. There's nothing there, but it has energy. The laws of quantum mechanics tell us that nothing is unstable. These last two are great. 70% of the dominant stuff in the universe is nothing. And my favorite of all, nothing is almost everything. If you redefine what nothingness is, you can have something come from nothing. You just have to redefine what nothing means. This is, this is genuinely probably the leading argument against the cosmological argument in our world today. And so, yeah, Krauss has come up with this ingenious way that allows something to come from nothing simply by redefining nothingness. And as I said, he's one of the two most eminent atheist philosophers who argue against the cosmological argument. And his very novel solution um, just involves a simple redefining of some words. But apart from Krauss, perhaps the other most eminent atheist philosopher uh, an opponent of the cosmological theory is a fellow called Peter Atkins, the one from that clip um, in that video before. Uh, and the person, um, oh yeah, sorry, he's, he's the person that you can hear uh, in the debate with William Lynn Craig, the one who says um, a couple of times, there is no evidence for the existence of God. And Atkins uh, also has, I think an even more interesting and fun way of tackling this argument and showing us that something can come from nothing. This is what Peter Atkins says. I'll read you the quote and then I'll talk about it a little bit. This is the quote. I think it is possible to argue that there is no energy in the universe with mass being another manifestation of energy through E equals mv squared. Yes, there are positive and negative contributions to the total energy, but I suspect that the total is zero, just like the total charge. So my first point is that there is nothing here at all. And the incipience of the universe was an event in which absolutely nothing, not even space-time, turned into a more interesting form of nothing, where opposites became distinguished. Such a view greatly simplifies, without solving, the problem of what happened at the creation. Absolutely nothing turned into more interesting net nothing. Now that, you might not be able to follow what he's saying there, but what he's saying is basically uh, that the energy in the universe either is positively or negatively charged, and that overall, the total charge of the positive and the negative has a total sum of zero, of neutral, right? And if you think about an analogy of a bank balance, 
if I had $10,000 in my bank balance, but I also had $10,000 in debt, how much money do I have? No money. I've got nothing. So in the universe, if you have a total of this amount of positive energy, energy being either energy or mass because of E equals MC squared, as long as you have an equal amount of negative energy and mass, what you really have is nothing because there's a zero sum. So everything in our universe balances out and in the end, we're left with nothing. So basically the argument there is something didn't come from nothing. Nothing came from nothing. And what we're living in right now is nothing. That's the argument. I think it's a very fascinating um, argument. And I guess the interesting thing for me is that I don't think that most atheists, most people who would say, you know, our oh, belief in God, it's silly, it's outdated, it's irrational. I don't think that most people realize that this is the philosophy that underpins the belief that there is no God, that there is no creator, there is nothing supernatural, the universe can explain itself. I don't think that they realize necessarily that this is where that lands them, that these are the <laughs> top leading theories to explain the universe without there being that timeless, immaterial, you know, uh, eternal being. This, this cosmological argument is just one, like I said, of a, quite a few different pieces of evidence. It's a single reason, I suppose, to believe that God exists. And as I said, it's not even my favorite one. Come next week. That, that'll, you'll see me really excited. I'll have a smile on my face all the time. I love it. But I find it fascinating that the same people um, who, I don't know, not always, but th there are a lot of people who I guess would really clearly assert <laughs> that it's silly to believe in God, that it's like having an invisible friend, that it's whatever, could, I don't know, believe that <laughs> belief in God is more rational, uh, that it you know, it's just straightforward that it's obvious. And I guess I find the whole thing kind of fascinating. For me, I think that the best explanation of why our universe exists is because there is an original, eternal, supernatural, uncaused cause for it. That's kind of my conclusion from all of this. <laughs>